uh, pleasure. My pleasure to welcome you, uh, Brent, to uh, the, uh, this lecture series. And when you press recording in progress, of course, my view of your bio disappeared just to make it harder for me. So let's see if I can find it again. I'm so sorry. Um, but Brent is joining us from A to okay. Q. Just take a uh, peep here. I'm sorry, what? Oh, maybe that was just a, a background noise there. Uh, Brent is joining, joining us from uh, AHRQ. And as you can see from his background, he is in the uh, capital of our United States of uh, America. Uh, and he is um, going to be telling us about how we can get funded for the kind of work that many of us are interested in. He's a senior program official at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Division of Practice and Improvement. And the ultimate goal of the research that he oversees is to identify and test healthcare system levers for improving care and quality and lowering the costs of care and reducing disparities. Those are all goals that I think many of us on this call can definitely get behind. Um, interestingly, he also serves as HRQ's lead on, on climate change and healthcare, um, an area of increasing interest. He uh, graduated from NYU, Magna Cum Laude in psychology, and he's got an MPH from Portland State University, um, and also studied at George Washington University. I'll hand it over to you, Brent. Thanks, Steve, and, and so glad to be here and um, presenting to this great team, the Center for Improvement. Um, you just mentioned some, some good news, but uh, we, we actually here at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality just got a new director yesterday to the agency, uh, Bob Valdez, um, who was at, at some point or another out at, out at RAND and UCLA and so has the, some, some California connection there. I don't know if he has any Stanford connection in particular, but um, you know, we're excited to have him on board and, and see what direction he takes the agency in. So take anything I say about agency priorities with a grain of salt, because we do have a, a new boss in town and that can um, change things up here. But I do want to spend um, just a, a little bit of time today um, hoping to get you a little bit more familiar with the agency and, and what we do and walk through a little bit of our, our grant funding process with you as well. And then uh, leave plenty of time at the end for, for any questions you might have for me. Um, so as I mentioned, from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, we, we generally call it ARC here. Um, some people call it AHRQ or other things. And our mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable, and work within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and with others to make sure that the evidence is understood and used. Um, so it, it, in short, often when I'm trying to summarize that mission, I just say our mission is to make healthcare better or improve healthcare. And so it uh, resonates very much with the mission of your center there. Uh, just to give you a sense of where we sit in the federal government, we're part of the broader Department of Health and Human Services, which is made up of 13 different uh, agencies. Our sister agencies include um, those such as NIH, Centers for Disease Control, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And um, probably the closest sister agency we have is NIH in that we're both primarily research funders. Um, that being said, NIH has a very different focus than we do, focusing primarily on uh, basic science, biomedical research, uh, developing new treatments, things of that nature. We're more interested in the, the healthcare system side of things. So how do we improve care? How do we get new evidence into practice? Um, how do we make healthcare safer, more affordable for patients? Uh, we think we'll, of ourselves as having three core competencies. So one, as I mentioned, is health systems research. The other is practice improvement, so creating, <sighs> creating materials to teach and train healthcare systems. Uh, to catalyze improvements in care. And then finally, data and analytics. We uh, maintain several national databases of uh, healthcare data based on surveys and hospital data uh, that we use to track and improve performance of, uh, of performance across the United States. 
Uh, just to give you a sense of our size, we, we are much smaller than NIH, but um, we consider ourselves small but mighty. And um, so our, our total grant funding in uh, 2020 was about $140 million. That varies somewhat year to year, depending on um, our, what, what our federal budget is like that year. Our primary sources of grant and contract funding, and I, and I mix in contracts here as well, although I know I'm supposed to primarily focus on grants because we also use contracts as another way to fund research and quality improvement across the healthcare system. Uh, so we have a strong patient safety focus. We've had that for a long time. That portfolio tends to focus, uh, that's probably our most I'd say sort of biomedically focused uh, part of the agency in that we focus, we do a lot of work there on reducing healthcare acquired infections, reducing medical errors, uh, combating antibiotic resistant bacteria, things of that nature. Uh, we have a, a smaller digital healthcare research portfolio, which we formerly called the healthcare, the health IT portfolio, focused really on the innovations that we're seeing in information technology, as well as things like wearable devices um, for patient care. Um, for the past 10 years and um, recently authorized for the next 10 years, we get a hefty chunk of money from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Trust Fund. And so you're probably familiar with PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, who takes the bulk of that money. But we get uh, nearly $100 million a year uh, for efforts focused on dissemination implementation of PCOR. Um, also clinical decision support work that's primarily around um, the IT adoption of clinical decision support. Um, so it, uh, integrating it with electronic health records, things of that nature. And then also a lot of uh, money goes into education and training for the next generation of patient center outcomes researchers. And then finally, we have our general health services research fund, which is what is behind all our, our general announcements uh, where you can um, you know, really bring your ideas to us, and it's it's the least directed of our portfolios. In that, you know, we want to have you all come to us with with your best ideas of how to improve healthcare and what the most important research areas are. Uh, getting a little bit more into the into the mechanisms, you'll recognize a lot of these from NIH if you've worked with them over there. We we share most of our grants infrastructure with NIH, so. Um, if you've ever filled out an NIH application, you'll know how to fill out an ARC application, um, and we have similar processes. So we have, uh, you know, typical large research grants, uh, small research grants. We also have conference grants, which um, are, are fairly large and a little bit unusual in that they're not just about sort of, you know, supporting meetings, but doing things like developing research agendas. Um, doing training sessions for uh, clinicians or researchers. Uh, so those are our general announcements. We also have calls for specific research. Those are requests for funding applications. Um, so those tend to be sort of one-time activities that we offer up and you'll find those all on our website. We also have general, um, we, we have what are called special emphasis notices, which are not funding opportunities themselves, but reflect new interests of the agency and sometimes the department. So for example, we put out a, we, we put out a, a special emphasis notice recently on uh, improving health equity in healthcare. Um, and so that applies to all of our standing program announcements. Um, that's something you can flag. We also offer a number of education and early career grants. Um, I already mentioned the, the PCOR funded ones, but there's also more general ones that can support uh, dissertation research, um, can support postdocs, can support early career researchers. Uh, these are all uh, great options for, for those getting started in health services research uh, to fund, uh, fund themselves, basically. I wanted to highlight a few grants that we currently have uh, with Stanford, just to give you a sense of sort of what we have uh, we have currently funded, but we've uh, funded many other things in the past as well. 
Uh, we fund a, a health services research training program uh, who, that's run by Lawrence Baker and Doug Owens. Um, that's a, a five-year grant, about 500000 a year. Uh, we have a, tip, a couple of R01s here, so that's the typical large research grant, uh, the effective bypass policies on stroke treatment uh, with uh, Dr. Govinda Rajan, uh, identifying optimal pain management for elders with Tina hernandez Bussard. And here are a few examples of, of those sort of uh, education and early career grants, uh, development and validation of a prediction model to address physician burnout, reducing racial disparities in advanced care planning, and impact of standardized communication on human performance during resuscitation. So you can see we, re we really covered a lot of ground here. Um, and I think pro probably most of these are coming in under our, our general health services research funding. So those are ideas that uh, these researchers brought to us and uh, we, we decided to fund. Uh, and I'll move on now to, to more sort of the application process. Um, I just saw Steve's comment there that he's uh, that he he works on the the ARC fellowship with with Lauren and Doug, and so um, you know connect with him if you have some questions about that. And I apologize if I'm missing anything in the chat here, uh, but I'll. I'll Come back. Don't and, worry about and, it, Brent. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, the yeah, you're tracking. Okay, great. Um, so, if you haven't been through either the the ARC or NIH application process before, I'll just walk through the the basics here and and offer some tips to that will hopefully help sort of orient you to how this works. Uh, so, first is the pre-application process, and that's really where you uh, start fleshing out your ideas, look around for potential funders. Um, I always encourage people to look around because it's, uh, you may find opportunities at PCORI, you may find opportunities at, at private foundations like Robert Wood Johnson, ARC may be the right home for you, but maybe not. Um, and that can change over time as agency priorities change and there are different funding opportunities. So I'd always encourage you to, to talk to a, a couple of places about your ideas and, and try to find the best fit there. Uh, next, you put together the, the actual application, which is a ton of work the first time, um, putting together everything that goes into that, but um, can become easier as you become more experienced and can reuse certain pieces of it. It then comes into ARC, is assigned to peer review sections, uh, where it will go undergo review. Um, it's a very competitive process. Uh, a, a general rule of thumb is that we fund less than 10% of what comes through the door. Um, so if you receive, uh, you can even receive a good score and not get funded, um, in which case you have to make a decision about whether to resubmit or uh, start over entirely or take your application somewhere else. If you have a competitive score, we'll ask you to respond to the review. Um, as a project officer myself, um, we'll make recommendations and present your application for funding to our leadership. If, if they sign off on it, then it'll go through a final administrative review. And then finally, you'll get an award. Um, this process can be anywhere from six months to a year. Um, and so planning well in a, ahead in advance is uh, very important, and uh, unfortunately, we just don't have a, a faster process at this point um, in years like this, where we also are working on a temporary federal budget for half the year, um, that can really slow things down as well, which is out, out of our hands, but um, just something to be aware of. Uh, if you haven't visited, I encourage you to go to ahrq.gov slash funding. There's really everything that you need here to walk you through the process. You can see uh, you can see the funding opportunities. You can see the what we funded in the past. You can see profiles of, of current and past grantees, uh, all types of training resources around the process. Talk a little bit now about the application process, uh, or sort of what's included in the application. So 
uh, you'll need bio sketches of, of the lead researcher and, and the key personnel. So this is where you put together your team. This can be a lot of work the first time around, but um, once you get it done, you can just update it for subsequent applications. You'll need to talk to your institution about getting information about uh, their capabilities and their expertise and infrastructure. You'll need to develop a budget, abstract specific aims of the research. The research strategy I, I highlight here because it's the bulk of um, the scientific portion of the application, so where you're really laying out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And then there's a lot of additional information you have to provide on things like human subjects, IRB, inclusion of women and minorities, uh, how you're going to manage data and, and uh, safety. I, I always tell people to write their, their abstract and title last because um, even though it's the introduction to your application, it should really provide that succinct summary of everything else that the reviewers are going to look at. Uh, not getting too wrapped up in background, but really laying out what it is that you're proposing to do and why it's important. Specific aims are closely related to the abstract, um, but lay out your, your more specific sort of research questions or in the case of you know, dis dissemination app implementation type of applications, what it is you're going to do. Uh, the research strategy is generally broken up into sections that align with um, basically the re review criteria. So um, trying to make it easy for reviewers to match up what they're scoring you on with what you're including in your application. So you're going to have some background with preliminary studies, what the field's looking like, significance, why is this important, who cares, um, innovation, what's, what's new in terms of uh, either filling gaps in the, in the field or introducing new methods, things like that. Uh, and then approach and methods I, I highlight here because this is something that is really uh, going to uh, really going to <clears throat> drag down an application that's otherwise very exciting. You can have great research ideas, have you know the most exciting new program that you want to pilot, whatever it might be. But if you don't describe well what you're going to do and give reviewers confidence in uh, what you're proposing. Uh, you're going to end up with a poor score and that application is not going to go anywhere. So making sure that you know your data and methods are appropriate, they're feasible, they're understandable to reviewers. Um, and I put this last bullet here just because, um, again, unlike NIH, ARC study sections of peer reviewers tend to be fairly broad and multidisciplinary. So you're not going to have this really narrow group of scientists who are looking at, you know, one type of molecule that might cause cancer or something like that, and they, they work in that field too. You're going to have social scientists, you're going to have clinicians, um, just a, a pretty wide range. So you really want to not dumb down things, but um, just make sure you're not using too much lingo, too many jargony things that are you know, make a lot of sense to you, but not others. You know, I, I always encourage people to, um, you know, have somebody read your application who's maybe not, uh, you know, part of your study team or, or not intimately familiar with your field. Uh, ARC doesn't have any specific preference for particular methods. You know, we, we like qualitative, we like quantitative, we like mixed methods. Um, we, we like to see logic and conceptual models that um, lay out, you know, theories of change and things like that. Um, you can you can do retrospective studies. You can do prospective. Really, uh, the reviewer is going to look for that match between what it is you're hoping to achieve with the study and whether those are the appropriate methods and, and data for that. Um, generally, avoid convenience populations and data just because you have some data at Stanford or data in hand doesn't necessarily mean it's the best uh, data to answer the questions. ARC is a national funder, and so um, while in some cases it's appropriate to study local or state or regional data, that has to be uh, you know, clear and justified why you're doing that. Um, 
if, if you're not a, a strong methods person, um, I would encourage you to get somebody on your team or get somebody to at least help you with um, that that method section of the application just to make sure you're covering your bases and don't leave yourself open to, to peer reviewers saying, you know, well, where's the, you know, power calculation or whatever, and um, just marking, you know, sort of tossing the application for things like that. Put together a timeline, um, you know, make it clear what you're, what you're doing at different stages of the project, especially if you're applying for something like a five-year, $2 million grant, um, you know, that's, that's a big project, and just make sure you've made it clear, sort of, you know, don't have three years at the end where you're just writing papers or something like that and saying that's going to justify uh, federal investment in your research. And and finally, just to address limitations, limitations and challenges. There's no, there are no perfect studies, and so, um, you know, those conversations that you're having with your team about potential weaknesses, how you're going to get around them, put put that in your application. Show show the reviewers that you've thought about it. Um, that's going to give them a lot more confidence and leave you less open to to sort of nitpicking and um, you know concerns that maybe you haven't thought things through that well. The, re the reviewers are also judge you on the investigative team. Um, so be clear about who's doing what and why. Um, it helps if you have, if the team has uh, past experience working together that you can show that you, you can manage a team, especially if you have people working across multiple institutions. Um, generally for new investigators, if, if you're not applying for sort of those education or training grants, it's often smart to try to link up with um, a, a more experienced researcher who has some, some funding track record. They don't necessarily have to be a major part of the project, but um, in my experience, it tends to give the, the reviewers a little bit more confidence in, um, in your ability to, to pull it off, basically, to do what you're, you're, you say you're going to do. Um, avoid to be determined team members. Um, that's that can be a challenge, but honestly, if you just have a even, even if it's a sort of grad student placeholder or something like that, if there if you have a name that you can throw in there, that uh, gives them a little more confidence that you're not just throwing in an idea and you know hoping you can put together a team later on. Uh, for the peer review process. Um, again, very similar to, to NIH, if you've been through that or done any, any trainings there. Um, this is evaluating the scientific and technical merit, and this is considered sort of the first council you'll, you'll hear as sometimes the term or the first level of review. The second level of the review is, is the senior leadership team at the agency that uh, it takes into account the peer reviewers scores. Uh, we have several study sections. These are specific to ARC, and so um, you'll, you'll always be applying to ARC. It's not that you'll be applying to ARC and NIH and get assigned to a different study section. Um, won't go into detail on those, but you can read all about them on the website. Uh, first step is application comes to ARC, and we have one person who takes a look at them, make sure they're make sure make sure that your application is technically acceptable, so that you're not, you know, you're not coming in with a 30-page application when you're supposed to have a 10-page page limit or something like that, or you're missing some key materials that are required. Uh, after that step, you'll get assigned your application will get assigned to at least three peer reviewers. Um, so every application that the agency accepts does get a review by uh, peer reviewers, um, and they'll provide their preliminary scores. And based on that, um, we have a, a process called triage or streamlining. And essentially, the, the lower 50% of applications in terms of scores will not go to the final review discussion and will not receive a, a final score. That being said, you will get comments 
from those three initial reviewers. So no matter what happens with your application, um, you will always get feedback that you can use to determine whether you want to resubmit or um, your next steps for the application. All other applications will go to full discussion by the full review panel. They'll get scored by everybody in that review panel, and you will get a, a final average score based on that. Um, you'll also be assigned a percentile based on several rounds of application review. Um, so you might have a score of 30 and a percentile of 15 or something like that. And, and the percentiles are really what the agency has to go off for funding decisions because that um, that allows us to kind of have a little bit more of an apples to apples across study sections and across time as well. And as, as you'll see here, the, the review criteria that you'll be up, up against in, in peer review is closely matched to what you should have in your application and probably want to um, you know, structure similarly as you know, significance, investigators, innovation approach, environment. Um, I'd say the real score drivers in general of, of that overall score are going to be the significance and the approach. So the reviewer is going to say, is this important? Does this speak to me as, as something the field needs, something that the field is going to move the field forward? And then is it well designed to achieve that result? I mentioned some of these earlier, and so I won't spend much time here, but um, you know, there's there's lots of additional criteria that they the reviewers will consider, and it's they're not uh, officially scored criteria, but potentially they can have um, impact on how reviewers feel about the application overall. Um, if you're not talking about how you're going to include women and minorities and our priority populations in the study sample, that may you know affect how they think about your application overall. If you're not treating human subjects seriously, if you have very little, little information there, again, that can, while it's not a score criteria, could potentially sour them on your application. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that goes into the applications, but um, you know don't don't ignore things that aren't part of sort of the main application because that can drag you down as well. Um, we have the same scoring system as NIH. Uh, scores are like in golf, lower is better. Um, so one is the best score and nine is the, the worst score when you're when you're looking over your um, your summary statement of reviewer comments and scores, you'll see these scores and um, it can be easy to get get turned around and, and think of it the other way around because that's often how scoring works. Um, Post review, as I, as I mentioned, highly competitive. Um, depending on the funding announcement and funding source, a, a general rule of thumb is, is sort of less than 10% of applications. Um, we generally fund in score order, um, so we'll we'll fund the top applications. But it's um, but there is some flexibility that we have as far as if there are things that are of particular interest to Congress, to the department, to the agency. Uh, we do consider the overall portfolio of research and of course the availability of funds in um, potentially you know, pulling up something that didn't score as well for funding. But for the, for, for the most part, we're guided by those peer review scores. Uh, I mentioned resubmissions earlier. They, a lot of people come to ARC, they put in their application, they don't go, it doesn't go anywhere, and they say, well, ARC must not be for me, I'm going somewhere else, or I'm, I'm never coming back to ARC. And I, I would encourage you not to have that um, attitude. I know it can be incredibly frustrating. You put a huge amount of work into these applications. Um, it comes in and it doesn't score well. Um, but those who revise their application based on the peer review comments and come back in with a resubmission, generally have a higher success rate. Um, so it can, this takes a while. I mean, this means going through two rounds of, of review for the same, um, same general study. Um, 
And this, this is making this decision can be tough. Um, you want to really look at what are the reviewers saying? Are, do they have fundamental weaknesses? Just saying, wow, this, this study is, you know, is no good. You know, I mean, it's, it's not addressing gaps in the field. The, the methods are terrible, whatever it might be. Um, hopefully they won't say that, but, uh, <laughs> but if it's along those lines, you'll have to consider whether it's worth revising. Uh, but if things are relatively minor and, and seem like um, more like areas of clarification or where there are specific things that reviewers tell you you could improve, those are really the best ones to revise and resubmit and get that better chance at funding the next time around. And so after you've been through all that process and um, you, you get your great score and you get funded, um, you'll, you'll get your notice of grant award finally. You'll have to produce annual and final reports, sometimes quarterly reports, depending on um, the, the nature of the award. Um, you'll let us know when you have exciting things coming out, like publications or, or uh, conference sessions, things like that. If you're making major changes in your study, those need prior approval from ARC, so you'll have to come to, to us with those ideas. Um, stay in touch with the agency, with your with your project officer. Um, let them know what to, what's going on, what's going with what's uh, happening with your study, and then, um, uh, given that the the grant process is so long, um, start thinking about that next application. You know, how, how does your current study build into the next? Um, what other ideas do you have? Are there you know, sort of small discrete things that you might want to tack on to a larger study. Um, so, you know, just always keep something in the hopper because it is is such a long process that I, I always encourage people not, not to kind of have all your eggs in one basket and just kind of sit here waiting around for a year or whatever it is, waiting to hear back about one particular study and how it did. Uh, reach, reach out early. Uh, we have project officers who have subject matter interest and expertise in lots of different areas. Um, they, can, they can clue you in on the different funding portfolios that we have. If you want to target something specific like patient safety or our digital healthcare research portfolios, um, have other people look at your application, um, consider all your funders. Um, got, got to throw in proofread there just because it's a you know, you put a, a ton of work into the into these applications, but if they're unreadable or confusing, um, that can really drag you down, and that's a, you know a, not not a happy place to be to get your application back and essentially have it marked up for editing rather than um, <laughs> sort of scientific merit. And and stay positive, like I'm saying, you know, keep uh, keep working on new ideas. Uh, you can you don't have to wait until one application is sort of through the entire process before you start you know putting in something else and that's that's my last slide i know that was a, a bit of a whirlwind but uh hopefully that gave you a little flavor of of arc and and sort of the application process but um happy to take any any questions that people have either in the in the chat or if you want to come off mute um, and, and I always point people to our website because that's the that's sort of the the one stop shop for everything that you'll need to know if you decide to come to us for funding. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much uh, for that nice overview of uh, the hows and the what of applying to art for funding. Um, I guess I could start off our question and answer uh, period um, by asking you, um, what do you see as the um, of the three major areas that you uh, talked about? What do you think see as the hallmarks of proposals that the review uh, process finds most attractive? So pushing science forward or tackling um, sort of questions or uh, making sure that you're using a brand new method. I'm sure the answer is going to be all of the above, but maybe you can just give us a, a, a bit of an overview there. Sure. Um, as you're saying, I, I wouldn't say it's any particular thing, but um, but but it is up to you as the applicant to convince the reviewers, right? So um, as I mentioned, the, the score driving factors tend to be significance and approach. So um, 
you know, if, and, and I would say it depends on, on the mechanism that you're coming in under as well. So for example, the R01, the goal is generalizable knowledge. Um, and so uh, research, the peer reviewers are going to look for, uh, you know, is this actually generalizable, looking at your data methods for that. For our other large grant, the R18, which is the demonstration and dissemination grant, they're look, going to look for impact in a more practical way. Um, you know, how is this uh, improving care in, in the real world? For small grants, they're going to look for, you know, is, is this either a sort of contained discrete study or is this something that is going to develop important preliminary data or preliminary findings that can be uh, parlayed into something bigger down the road. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a bit across the board and, um, uh, and I'm speaking mainly to the general announcements for, for specific announcements. There's, there's much clearer criteria on sort of this is what we're looking for um, for applicants here. So if we're looking at, you know, combating antibiotic resistant bacteria, that's going to have a, a, a much narrower focus and uh, areas of interest than somebody coming into our general uh, just sort of program announcements. Thanks. Um, a lot of the people on this call are very much on the applied side of health services, research, implementation, science, even at the border of quality improvements. Um, maybe you could give a sense of what the opportunities are there. And Mary, I see that you've asked a question, and I will get to your question next. Sure. So this is a, a, a strong and I, I would say growing over time interest in the agency, um, in, in part driven by our, our large amount of funding from the Patient Center Outcomes Research Trust Fund. Um, ARC's role as designated by Congress is focused on dissemination and implementation of PCOR work. Um, so I would definitely encourage people to follow those uh, announcements, those tend to be a little bit more of the, the one-off announcements, but we also do have the education and training grants that are that are funded by PCOR as well. So all those are going to have strong uh, dissemination implementation type of focus, uh, quality improvement type of focus. Um, a, a, a ongoing initiative we have is called Evidence Now, uh, which, which you may have heard of, but is uh, generally focused on taking uh, PCOR and, and finding different ways to uh, implement it in, in practice. So we're, we're doing things like funding practice facilitation, um, IT solutions, things like that. Um, and that's often a mix of grants and contracts. So that's going to be a strong area there. Um, that being said, even in just our standing announcements, you can certainly come in with um, you know, quality improvement type of work. Um, again, I'll, I'll say that we are, a, since we are a national funder, um, there's, uh, you know, there is some push to, you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to come in with just sort of like one healthcare setting and say, you know, we want to improve XYZ in our hospital or something like that. Um, because, you know, we can't possibly fund every hospital in the country to do similar work. And so we want to always, so e even with the quality improvement work, we want, we're always looking for lessons learned, looking for, you know, what can we, even if it's a limited setting or settings, what are we taking away from this that others can learn from? Um, or, or what can we learn from this pilot project or something like that, that we might use to inform policy, for example, um, you know, we, we might want to go over to Medicare and Medicaid and say, hey, we funded this research. This would be a great thing for you to actually, you know, reimburse providers for or something like that. So always looking to that next step of how, how can we have a bigger impact than just this particular thing that we're funding um, today. A good point that a single institutional um, uh, applications are hard to get funded at ARC. I certainly noticed that myself by which I mean institutions that only uh, seek to improve care or test um, for to care in a single institution. Uh, Mary, go ahead with your question. I was wondering, um, I'm an earth scientist, and I wondered if you had 
suggestions specific to multidisciplinary team applications? Or, in fact, I wondered how often nurses submit applications, um, you know, whether it's predominantly uh, physician led. I wasn't sure about that. Sure. It's, uh, at ARC, we definitely believe research is a, a team sport um, in, in health services research. And so it's, it's unusual, actually, I'd say that we have applications where a team is made up of sort of people from the same background. Um, so uh, we, we'll often have mixes of, of clinicians, whether they be physicians, nurses, you know, PAs, whatever you might have, um, along with social scientists who may be more experienced in some, some methods uh, type of applications, um, might have some, some data people on the team, things of that nature. For the more applied studies, certainly it, it's a, e even a broader mix. I, I think we would love to fund more nurse researchers. Um, we, we don't, let's say we get a, a, a ton of applications led by nurse researchers, but, um, but many of our applications are also not led by physicians. They're led by, mm. um, by more social scientists. People, you know, could, could have economists. You could have people who are, you know, psychologists. You know, people in so, sort of more of the social science realm who then rely more on the clinicians for access to to study sites or for their clinical expertise around particular conditions. Thank you very much. Sorry. Hey. Any other uh, questions from the group as a whole? Uh, another one that I thought up was um, you mentioned qualitative research. There are a couple of qualitative researchers on this call. And um, it often people will ask, does ARC fund a uh, projects that are primarily qualitative? By which I mean that the qualitative is not simply supporting some larger quantitative effort, but the main purpose of it is to collect qualitative information. And um, I've heard varying answers. Uh, what, what would be yours? Sure. Um, I, I would say that we're always looking for that, that match between the, the methods and the goal of the study, right? And so um, I think qualitative work can sometimes have a little bit more of an uphill battle in, in justifying significance and that it often tends to be a bit more localized, a bit smaller scale, and it's, it's intensive. I mean, it takes a, a lot of resources if you're out there doing interviews, focus groups, uh, you know, digging deep into these things in, in a way that, you know, doing secondary analysis of some, some data set is, is not going to require. And yet at the same time, those, those quant people can come and say, you know, we have a national data set or whatever. So it's, um, I, I think there, while we, there's no particular preference, I, I think it still has to be justified sort of what's gonna be that, that impact on, on the field. Um, be, you know, so we, we wouldn't fund probably something like say an ethnographic study of one, one you know, primary care practice or something like that. We want to, we'd want to see something connected to a, a broader research question or a broader policy question. Um, you know, I think we, we saw what, one of the things we're funding with Stanford, I, I saw as, you know, related to, to clinician burnout. Um, I think that's an area that's going to, that's, you know, very, uh, what qualitative methods are very applicable and, um, and studying, um, you know, what types of interventions might actually make a difference in improving burnout or things like that. Um, so it's, I don't have a, a real solid answer, but I, I'd say there's no, there's no bias against it. Um, if anything, reviewers, I think, make more comments about applications where there's sort of a, a bit of a qualitative piece that's just kind of tacked on um, saying, okay, we're going to, you know, 
interview a couple people and nobody on the team has qualitative expertise. They, they want to see that, that matchup of, of people who really know what they're doing and know how to analyze that qualitative data and make something meaningful out of it. Yeah, it's a truism that the methods have to match the research questions. And, um, I often think that qualitative methods are the best uh, for many of our research questions, but it is a little bit harder to uh, convince people of their generalizability, perhaps for no good reason. Any questions from uh, the group as a whole? I was just wondering if Brent could comment on, did anything, anything come your way or um, during COVID that, that like with your time frame that, you know, kind of broke all the rules on and how long it typically takes and how long it took during COVID and any lessons learned or reflections you have from that, if, if that's applicable. Sure. So we did make, um, we did make some slightly faster uh, awards during COVID. Um, we, we funded a number of supplements to existing projects to allow them to pivot to uh, address COVID related issues. Um, I'd say also for those, perhaps there was a little bit more interest in, in getting some projects funded than perhaps our, our typical peer review rigor in, in what got funded there, knowing that that applicants were having to put together applications in a very short amount of time in a, in a pretty hectic environment, but at the same time wanting ARC to be able to contribute to the, the department's efforts and the government's efforts in addressing COVID. Um, I think we're, we're already getting a lot of interesting findings out of those studies and um, you know, thinking about things like the rapid adoption of, of telemedicine and telehealth modalities, um, think about what it means for a lot of people to have put off care during this time um, in terms of prevention and effects on longer term, um, thinking about even how we pay for care. Um, you know, the, uh, all of a sudden there's a lot more interest in, in value-based care arrangements from primary care physicians and others because um, you know, if you're if you're on that fee for service tre treadmill and there's nobody coming in for care, um, your practice gets impacted very quickly. So I, I think um, there there'll be lots of lessons learned from those COVID research investments, even if it meant that we we perhaps had to um, not fund some other projects that we might have funded in in normal times. Interesting. Very interesting. Hey, I wonder if you could think of an example of a recent HRQ project that um, you're particularly proud of or the agency is particularly proud of that seems to have made a difference? Sure. Um, so this this isn't um, particularly a, a investigator initiated research grant like we've been talking about, but we did just or are currently still funding a, a nationwide learning network for nursing homes around um, patient safety issues related to COVID. Um, so this was a massive undertaking, um, pulled it off the ground really quickly. And then over time it's, it's adapted to, you know, from the early days of COVID thinking about, you know, how do we keep patients and staff safe with, with PPE to later on thinking about how do we overcome vaccine hesitancy among the, the nursing home staff, uh, many of whom uh, were unvaccinated. Um, so that's, that's an example of a very applied work, I'd say, but um, was drawing on lessons we've learned um, from a lot of the work that we funded in, in patient safety over the years. Um, so I think it's never just sort of one study that we fund that's, you know, changes the world or whatever. It's that um, that buildup of evidence, uh, that buildup of evidence over time and thinking about how we can apply it. And so uh, for, for, for you all on the more sort of applied side, just always think, you know, what can we draw on from the, the past? Let's not, let's not reinvent the wheel every time. Let's, let's pull together some of those study findings from the past and, and apply that um, rather than acting like sort of every 
every quality improvement project is is brand new or you know that nobody's thought about these things before okay let's see it, uh oh go ahead jake yes go ahead yeah uh steve you kind of touched on this uh but uh brent love to hear your thoughts on this uh, qi projects are not going not going to have the same rigor as a research study the same evaluation is that something that reviewers are looking at? Or are they differentiating the two? Or what are your thoughts on that? Sure. I, I mean, I think the, the line's often blurry, right? I mean, it's um, especially for, for smaller scale things, but, um, and there's certainly different considerations for, for sort of what counts as, as research versus a internal quality improvement project. You know, in terms of things like human subjects and data protections and all these things that you wouldn't have to do if you were just doing a QI project within your own institution without trying to, you know, publish or, or create sort of more generalizable knowledge. Um, I, I think sometimes it's a question of scale and, and what the evidence is. Um, you know, if there's if there's a lot of good evidence that some intervention quality improvement type interventions going to improve quality of care or reduce costs or whatever it might be. Um, I think you can all often go for one of our, our larger um, demonstration dissemination type of grants, um, you know, maybe partner up with some other institutions and uh, take that, that evidence from previous uh, studies and and put it into practice, and that can be sort of bridging the gap uh, between the two. I, I think just the the nature of our 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 funding is is never really going to support uh, seed funding for you know individual institutions to do quality improvement projects. Uh, at, at least from what I can see, um, it might happen as part of something larger like like the nursing home network or something like that, there might be um, funds available through sort of a larger project aiming at quality improvement on a large scale. Um, but, but I just don't, I don't think there'll be um, many opportunities for that, that more sort of local QI type of funding. And also may probably just wouldn't necessarily be worth it either. I mean, putting together an application for federal funding is a, is a huge amount of work. Um, and, um, and you're probably not gonna be as competitive for sort of large grants. So, you know, potentially like a RO3 pilot study, something like that, but um, we're not talking a lot of, about a lot of resources. And so you'd have to really think about whether that's the right way to go versus maybe targeting, uh, you know, maybe some private foundations or something like that that have a much less onerous application process and that you could um, get funding probably much more quickly. Because with QI also, I mean, there's the leadership buy-in and things like that. If you're looking at a multi-year funding application process, maybe you don't even have leadership who are interested in that project anymore by the time it comes through, in which case, you know, it's a, a tough deal. And, and, you might have a little bit less of that problem with with more traditional research. Very helpful. Sorry. Thanks, thanks yeah. Brent. That's helpful. Thanks, Brent. So, uh, sorry, Lisa. sorry, I don't have better better news, but just it's you know I don't want anybody to waste their time putting together a big application that probably won't do well. You understood. Um, uh, Lisa points out that we have been able to combine occasionally in large uh, groups. There was the RAM study that worked on uh, provider wellness. So um, I'm just really grateful that you were willing to spend this time giving us the ins and outs of HRQ funding. Thank you so much. I hope everybody will join me in thanking Brian Sandemeyer and uh, for his expertise. Um, uh, maybe you'll be willing to um, entertain some emails from the people who- We met in person last week, and it's so much better when you clap in person. <laughs> yes, it is. Isn't it? Isn't it? In person in general is better. I'm, I'm a big fan of three dimensions myself. But um, with that, we will give you just a few minutes before your next appointment at the top of the hour. And again, thank you very much, Representative. Thanks for having me, everybody. And I'll, I'll 
send these uh, slides over your way so that you can you can share them around. Um, That's nice. But yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Great chatting with you. That's super helpful, Brent. Thank you so much. Okay.